Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and good night for those of you who are already overseas. Uh, welcome everyone for our first law science event for this spring 2023. I am Vanessa Molinueva. I am a law science um, coordinator. Law science is an academic initiative coordinated by a group of uh, JC candidates who share the same belief in legal methodologies. Uh, legal studies have been generally understood as a discipline that has been outside a scientific approach, traditionally consisting of doctrinal analysis and debate on normative questions. However, we as law science believe that it can be improved by and benefit from scientific methodologies that provide systematic ways to approach questions and deliver falsifiable claims. If you want to learn more about the Law Science Project, please visit our website that is going to be dropped on the chat box here. Um, and you can also join our mailing list. To that end, I want to introduce our coordinators. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Daniel Hefke. He is a, a JSD candidate from Cornell Law School. Simon Sun is an SJC at Indiana University Moore School of Law. And Patrick Kim Kiyawan, who is a JSD candidate from the Law School at the University of Chicago. I also want to introduce uh, Kathy Kim. She is a, an SJD candidate and coordinator at the Broadway Colloquium at Moore School of Law. And this graduate colloquium at Indiana University is where doctoral candidates at the Mara School of Law find their niche. Um, this session is between the JV workshops at the University of Illinois College of Law. We have also online some faculty members uh, from the uh, University uh, of Illinois and some JV candidates, which are also here with me in person with some of the same colors. Thank you very much for your attendance. So today we have invited Professor Alan uh, Kugel. He is an assistant professor of law at the University of Kentucky, uh, J. David Rosenberg College of Law. Uh, he holds a BA in sociology and English from the University of Illinois, a JD from Georgetown University, and a PhD in jurisprudence and social policy from the University of California, Berkeley, who is also a uh, joining us uh, today uh, as part of the Law Science Project, uh, some students from uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Before joining the University of Kentucky Rosenberg College of Law, Professor Kugel was a visiting assistant professor at the University of Illinois College of Law. His research interests include corporate law, the legal profession, and the empirical study of law, including network analysis, which uh, be the topic of today, hierarchical and longitudinal models and formal modeling. The topic of today's network, and you can see this first slide, is networks and the law. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Thank you to everybody, Vanessa, and everybody who organized this. I was saying before this started, I think this is an absolutely wonderful idea. Uh, I wish this had been around when I was in uh, graduate school. I think it is a uh, um, a, a really great thing to be able to um, expose yourself to any the, the the number of methods, right? Because some of them some of them you'll 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 find really helpful. Some of them you'll you know put away in some part of your brain and bring them out later in your career when you need them. So getting exposure to all these sort of different ways that you can approach the law from as a sort of an empirical area of study is all for the best. Even if it's something that you don't, you know, necessarily use right away, having it in your in your pocket for later is, is very good. So, I'm here to talk about uh networks, specifically network analysis and how it uh, uh you know, how it works just generally, right? Right from the basics, assuming no no uh no knowledge beforehand of this subject. Um talk about how it has been applied to uh legal uh questions, both questions about the law itself and questions about the legal profession and uh, sort of walk through some of these sort of uh, more cutting edge research that's out there in this field as it applies to the law. So just start with the basics here, some terminology. The um, uh, uh, This is a field that grew up with in many different areas. This uh, originally started as sort of graph theory and mathematics, which is where you get the terms vertices and edges. It's also been used in computer science, which is where you get sort of nodes and links and in social science, which is where you get actors and ties. Actors are just the participants in the network. 
actor suggests people, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, right? We, we'll talk in a second about this, but you can use states, documents, things like that, things that aren't necessarily, you know, sentient beings as the sort of nodes, the uh, important actors in your networks. The ties represent uh, uh, some sort of relationship. That's what this realistically is. It's an empirical documenting of relationships. And the ties, also known as links, also known as edges, right, are the ones that connect these actors in the network. And they can do that through two ways here. You can have directed one way or reciprocal networks. This is, think about something like um, a good example of a one-way network would be a gossip network, right? You hear gossip from somebody, you don't tell it back to them, right? You spread it on and it spreads on going one direction around the people in the network. A uh, reciprocal sort of a directed network, think about a friendship network, right? I say somebody's my friend, they say they're my friend. That's a two-way reciprocal uh, directed relationship. There are, there are friendship networks, you can find these uh, out there where uh, friendship goes one way some, sometimes. I think this person's my friend, they don't think that's, they're my friend, or you know, I'm their friend. That can be a one-way directed uh, uh, network as well. An undirected network is something where these two actors have something in common, some sort of connection that binds them, right? It's not directed this way or that way, they're not sending or receiving ties, but they are connected. So that's what an undirected network is. And a network is just the name for the collection of everybody in that population, all the actors and all the ties. So you've got this, this representation and you can represent it mathematically, but I will confess that one of the advantages of networks is you get to represent them visually. This is the network of all the characters in Star Wars. Right? So you can say which characters in Star Wars interacted with each other, right? who had the most screen time, that's how the size of the, uh, these, these, uh, uh, the size of these nodes, right? who's the, in the, uh, the uh, dark side, who's in the emperor, empire up there at top, and who's actually in the re rebellion, et cetera, et cetera. You can make these things uh, really, really pop. You can show your population and their relations to one another visually, which is a really nice element too. Now, one of the other things that you see in this, in this graph is that uh, often representations of networks will take actors that are more central, more important, one actors that connect different parts of the network and put them, it's just algorithmically put them in the center of the network. So here, obviously Luke, the protagonist of the movie gets put in the center of that network. So if it, that's basically all you need is, is actors, ties, define your population and visualize the ties like this. That seems like we might have some grist to do some work with the law, right? Um, oops. Sorry, my first slide here. Um, the uh, uh, this, I'll talk about this real quick. This was supposed to go after the next slide, whatever. The conceptual insights of networks is that these actors and these networks, the structure itself, right? Not, it's not just you know what you know, it's who you know. Those can be advantages. Those can give you different uh, perspectives, give you different access to resources, access to information, right? So being in the center of a network or being a sort of actor that connects two disparate parts of the network, being a broker can be actually be advantageous and on top of that, there is a sort of theory that this sort of your position in the network might affect your behavior. You can observe other people in the network. You can observe the connections they're making and change how you act depending on where you are in that network structure. So with that being said, my next slide, this one, the idea of what you can use network analysis for in the law. And I'm going to say that there are two basic threads here, one of which is let's take a look at this profession. This is a social profession. This is a collaborative profession. We have uh, uh, people who work on different deals with one another. We have people who work on different lawsuits, right? Maybe they oppose each other, but they get, they, they, they create connections that way. Or maybe there are two law, uh, lawyers that team up for a particular matter, for a particular practice. That Those are ties. You can visualize this. You can, you can show how um, uh, lawyers or, or firms connect, grow, uh, change together in the sort of network of practitioners, right? The social structure of the bar. You can also show ties, this is one of my fields here, ties within legal organizations. How do attorneys in these organizations interact? How do they, how do those uh, internal networks change over time? What do they mean in terms of power within an organization? So that's the sort of one, one area. Let's take a look at lawyers and legal institutions. And the other one is this idea of law itself as the foundation of a network. So obviously judges issue opinions. Opinions are built on citations to past, uh, past uh, precedent. 
you can take those and put them into a network structure with every sort of citation being a, a link in that particular network. This is popular also in terms of uh, uh, you know academic work, right? Showing the network of citations in papers and how those evolve, who becomes the most centrally cited paper, right? Which 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 fields you know grow and die as they become more or less popular, as they're more or less cited, those sorts of things. You can do that with judicial opinions as well. Not just judicial opinions, statutes. Statutes reference one another, right? They reference themselves, but they also re reference other areas of the law. So you can put together sort of this network. And, and uh, an enterprising scholar, uh, you know, Dan Dan Daniel Martin Katz, did this for the entire U.S. Code. What were the sort of connections between all of these statutes in the U.S. code. It created a, a, a visualization so uh, so large that it uh, crashed my computer when I tried to open it, but that is the sort of thing that you can do with this, right? So generally speaking, people kind of focus on one area of the law or another to try to kind of see what the patterns of development in that law is as represented in these networks. So here's a here's a cross-referencing uh, uh, network in terms of uh, the law that I was able to put together. It's relatively simple, relatively straightforward. This asks the question, if you are a lawyer practicing in one state, what are the rules for you moving your practice, waving into another state? This is uh, basically all the states in the union. There are essentially three, as you can see, three groups of states. The ones on the far left, those are the ones that nobody can wave into under any circumstances. That's California, Louisiana, you know, civil code based uh, states. The one in the uh, in the uh, middle are states that anybody can wave into for whatever reason. They allow Illinois, for example, allows all 50 states. If you're a member of the bar, you can practice them for a certain amount of time. You can wave into them. The, well, the states on the right side have a re reciprocity requirement. So those states will only admit uh, 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 practitioners to wave in from states if they allow them to wave to those states, right? So if they have that relationship, uh, looks like Arizona and, uh, and uh, Arkansas can go into each other's, uh, uh, can wave into each other's jurisdictions, uh, they will recognize that relationship, but they aren't going to extend that courtesy to places like Louisiana that don't, right? And so you see, and I've colored the uh, ties there, if it's a reciprocal tie, that is to say back and forth, uh, uh, turns can go back and forth. It's in green. If it's one way only, that's in red. So California can go to Illinois. Illinois cannot go to California. Right? It's a way to sort of represent the different uh, different legal regimes and how they orient themselves to each other. Right? The uh, uh, the way this network is 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 designed is that states that have that sort of reciprocal arrangement are grouped closer to each other in the network in the in the visualization. So again, relatively straightforward, rel relatively simple. You know, want to include the entire U.S. code? Go for it. That's that's beyond uh, beyond the amount that of work I was willing to do. Um, but beyond simply like visualizing these things, identifying the sort of uh, the uh, uh, properties, the basic sort of uh, look and feel of the network, the little clusters of actors that might have uh, share relationships. There are other things you can take this even further. You can you can do even more analysis on these sort of networks. One of the things you start with when you do that is this idea of, okay, let's actually start breaking down what these, what, what, what are the uh, uh, attributes of the individual nodes, of the individual actors in the network. So you can look at this, you can break it down, you can say, okay, well, are there particular attributes of the people that send ties, the people that are making the citations or working with somebody else that makes them want to be collaborative, makes them want to collaborate with them. There's something about them, maybe it's their level of experience. Right. It can be other things, you know, uh, uh, race and gender, right? Uh, evidence of discrimination. People don't, you know, maybe people in the network don't have strong connections with those uh, people in sub uh, subgroups, right? That can be, you know, again, evidence of discrimination in these networks, right? So you can do this, you can break it down uh, uh, and do analysis of who essentially, you know, gets to be part of this network, who gets to be central in the network, who gets to rise to sort of prominence, who have a lot of connections in the network break it down by the attributes of the actors in there. So if it's a person, gender, race, education, political party, things like that, anything that's intrinsic to that to that actor. If it's a document, look at opinion length or age or subject matter. There's evidence that the sort of citation of older documents has this sort of decay function where it doesn't, you know, older ones aren't cited as much anymore. There's a certain time period in which they're going to be a critical part of that network and then they're going to fall off over time. So the idea behind this is that this, you know, measures just attributes of the actor in the network and how those relate to network structure and overall sort of uh, the, the, the sort of function within that network. 
You can also look at pairs, right? This is called homophily, the tendency of like to connect to like, right? Birds of a feather flock together. The idea here is it's not, we're not just looking at individual, right? Individual no, uh, nodes in the network, individual actors, but pairs, is there a sort of similarity between them? Does that create these sort of ties, right? So it's not just there's something attractive about this particular actor that makes me want to uh, send a tie to them. It's that we, we share similarities, right? Obviously gender and race are, are big ones, socioeconomic factors. Um, if it's, uh, uh, for, this is for a, a court examination, right? Does geography matter? How much does geography matter for these, these nodes to be that similar in terms of where they're placed? Um, the, uh, uh, the sort of idea, again, is not we're looking at individuals. We're now examining pairs and seeing if those pairs match up or if the pairs are dissimilar, do they not, uh, do they uh, uh, seek to form a tie then? That, that, that can be a sort of like, uh, sort of uh, the opposite of homophily, that uh, opposites attract. You can see that in networks as well. And then finally, we're going to get the actual structure, right? This is when we move past one actor in the network or two actors in the network and go towards, all right, let's see like what, what happens outside in terms of the overall structure. One is reciprocity, right? If I send a tie, does that increase the chances of sending a tie back? If I cite to you, do you cite back to me? If I say you're my friend, do you say I'm your friend as well, right? The, uh, uh, it's an indication of collegiality in networks to have these sort of, uh, have these sort of structures. The uh, brokerage, a friend of a friend tends to be a friend. This idea is that, you know, if A is friends with B and uh, B is friends with C, maybe A will become friends with C. Similar idea between, you know, if A has worked with B and B has worked with C, does that create a more, make it more likely for A to, to work uh, with C or to cite C or any of these sort of things, right? You have you, the, the existence of these relationships, of these ties between other actors in the network, does that close these sort of triangles, right? Does that, does that actually function to broker a new connection, right? And one of the theories here is that parties that can do this, that sit between two uh, actors who aren't connected, right, or two bodies of law or something like that, can essentially uh, control that, those relationships and be in more uh, of a position of power or more, be more influential in the network than people who are otherwise sort of disparate, right? They can bring people together. That's, that's important. That's an important network position. Popularity, this is the sort of uh, sometimes called the Matthew effect, right? The idea that, you know, the, the rich get richer, people with lots of friends tend to have more friends, right? This is the idea that nodes with a lot of ties tend to attract new ties. This is particularly useful in something like the law where you, you have a handful of extremely prominent uh, cases or maybe prominent judges or something like that. Do those tend to attract new citations by virtue of just being sort of everybody citing to them, right? It's the most, most photographed barn in America. It's the idea that everybody's citing this case because it's a case that everybody cites to, something like that. Does that exist in the network? You can look at that in terms of uh, legal documents and legal institutions and see if this exists as well. And then finally, we've got this idea of clustering. This is the tendency for cliques in networks to form. And again, think about it in terms of the profession. What are these sort of different areas of the bar? Who ultimately works with other people? Are there people who are excluded from these networks or form their own cliques or are sort of marginalized and don't get invited to these cliques at all? Right. The um, um, uh, there's a seminal study out of Chicago back in the 70s called the two hemispheres of the bar. It found that the the bar at the time was highly um, sort of had these very distinct cliques geared around who your clients were. Did you represent individuals or corporations? It wasn't really so much about your practice area. It was about the the client that you had. And the, so the the uh, the the click that had the corporate clients that had more status, they tended to have more political connections. They tended to, uh, you know, have, you know, uh, uh, socialize with one another in a way that the other half of, bar, of the bar, the other hemisphere didn't, right? The people were representing, you know, they were criminal defense lawyers or, um, or you know, family law practitioners, something like that. They had a very different social structure, social life and professional life than the other hemisphere of the bar. So do these exist, right? To what extent do clusters exist in these networks? So again, take all of these sort of different questions, all of which have, you know, different meanings for a particular network and apply them to these sources of, of law to the legal world, right? So here's a particular example. This was work I did with a professor named uh, Ryan Copas at I think he's at um, uh, Missouri, Kansas City now. This is every this is every federal judge for a ten year period, and whether or not they cited to each other. This looks like a uh, star exploding because it's, it's a very large network. It has something like five hundred or, or six hundred judges. 
it is uh, arranged so that the most uh, cited judges, the ones that are the largest dots in this particular network, are towards the center. But it, it reveals that we have in the federal judiciary a really core periphery structure. There are a, you know, a sort of centralized, very uh, highly cited uh, number of judges that are there in the middle. And then there are judges around the edges that are hardly cited at all, right, or, and hardly cite at all which is sort of an interesting phenomenon in terms of trying to think about like, well, where is law really made, right? Is it made by every member of the judiciary equally, or is there a sort of disparate production factor for these more central nodes in the network? And then start thinking about that. It's like, well, how did they get to be the most central nodes in the network? Who are these people? And what is the, you know, what is the nature of their potential influence on the development of law, at least at the district court level? Well, the uh, uh, one thing you can do, this is the same network, just visualized differently, is we can start taking these sort of measures, these, me these mathematical measures of the network, right? How dense is the network? Uh, one would mean that every, every node, every actor, every judge here is connected to every other judge, which would be a completely saturated network and would be uh, very unlikely to see in practice. Here, it's actually quite low, right? There is a low density. This, is, this suggests that, yeah, judges generally cite to a couple of their friends Maybe people, you know, we'll talk in a second, people in their court uh, courthouse or in their district. But outside of that, generally speaking, this isn't a very like robust network. It's not something that, you know, you see a lot of, uh, a, you know, really, you know, dense sort of cross collaboration. The diameter, diameter of a network is just the, the uh, uh, widest point for like trying to get from point A to point B from judge one to judge 560. You know, what is the sort of... Uh, 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 the, the, the sort of width of that, how many degrees, if you've ever played six degrees of Kevin Bacon, this is basically that number here. How many connections do you need to get from one judge to another? And then clustering. Clustering actually is, is somewhat robust here, suggesting that there is something that is organizing these judges into uh, various sort of subclusters in this, in this network. So those are just basic sort of descriptive measures of it. Let's dive in, see what else we can find out about this. Was it party maybe that would create these sort of uh, different uh, clicks and different uh, sub networks that we, we saw? Not really. If you visualize this by uh, by uh, uh, party citation, right? Blue being uh, uh, Democratic appointed judges citing, you know, citing out. Red being Democrat uh, Republican appointed judges citing out. Not a lot there. And ultimately, I'll show you the numbers when you run when you run the model. It doesn't really support the idea that this is just a function of Democrats citing Democrats and Republicans citing Republicans. It does seem to be the visualization kind of confirms that it's it looks like a big mess there. If you see a graph like this and it looks like a mess, that's a good sign that there's nothing, nothing uh, that you're actually going to uh, observe in the data. But when you break it down by this, so this is uh, a visualization by circuit, right? Each circuit judge, uh, like each, not, not circuit judges, sorry, but like the district judges in each particular circuit are given a certain color here. And you can see, all right, now I've got an idea. This sort of magenta, which represents the second circuit, the uh, red that represents the ninth circuit, and the blue that represents the tenth circuit, those are judges that do not generally cite outside of their circuit. Right. Whereas in other, you see in the other sort of like circuits, they're 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 much more Catholic. They're much more willing to cite judges who are in different districts, different states, things like that. But the uh, the ninth and the second circuit do have reputations for thinking of themselves as the the best and the brightest of the judiciary, and maybe they don't feel the need to cite out, outside of their uh, outside of their colleagues in those areas. So now we're getting closer to an explanation for why you know, the network looks the way it does. What are the most important things in this network of judges? So rather than, you know, again, you can just uh, make pictures for, for days and it's, it's fun. I really do enjoy it. But a way to get a little more uh, uh, meat on the bone here is to run this through a model. This is the technique called exponential random graph modeling. Uh, again, comes out of graph theory. The idea is let's take a, a, you know, the number of ties that we see and the number of actors in the network and we'll run this. We'll run this 100,000 times, a million times as a sort of random growth model and see how far the observed model is away from the sort of randomly generated models, given what we know about actor attributes, right? The, 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 the characteristics of each individual judge, about the homophily, the potential for likes attracting likes, and what we know about the sort of network structure. What are the sort of most important things towards determining whether a judge will cite another judge in any particular, any particular case? And so the I guess the dependent uh, uh, variable here is the probability of tie formation, and you throw in all these attributes to see what you can what you can find. So in the in the most robust model, the one that includes all of the different attributes along the far right, the things that matter the most 
kind of the, the, the graph gave you an idea there, district, state, and circuit, right? Those are the strongest ge geography turned out to be the strongest predictor. It makes a lot of sense. And I had to confirm something that probably people knew, which is that most judges will say, if I need a citation, go and see if one of my colleagues has something on this. If not, find something within 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 our district, right? If not, find something within our state, right? That's what, that's what the uh, sort of, you know, you could talk to clerks. They would give you that sort of idea, but here it is represented in the data. The other one that's, uh, the other two that are, are relatively robust are uh, the transitivity, right? This is what I was talking about with the brokerage. So if they have cited a judge before and they see, you know, they observe the uh, the judge citing to another judge, right? A third judge, it, cre it, it increases the uh, possibility that they're going to cite to that judge as well, right? There's a sort of degree of trust that you see if there's somebody that whose work you've cited, cites out, you are more likely to cite them as well. And then reciprocity, which is just the idea that, yeah, if a judge cites to a particular another judge, the other judge is more likely to cite to them back. There are, this is a, this is not just, you know, the development of the law in a, in a vacuum. This is a, this is a real, you know, so there's a social structure here. There's a, there's a society here that, uh, that uh, uh, these sort of, you know, modeling these uh, uh, sort of citations can pick up on. Right? In addition to the sort of what we kind of understood to be more legal factors, this idea of, you know, being citing geographically to your to your peers, um, that the, uh, those exist as well. Meanwhile, the uh, sort of uh, ideas of homophily, right, or Democrats citing to Democrats or men citing to men, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't really seem to exist in the data so much as once you control for this idea that, yeah, we have this, we have these sort of network structures and we have this very, very strong geographic preference. So that's just one example out of out of uh, work I've done. There's tons of other uh, people doing work in different areas. One of the earliest ones, which is why this this is graphic is very low res, um, was a citation network of Supreme Court precedents. Right. So um, one of the uh, issues. So when we worked, we worked as citations as between judges, but you can do this with cases as well. The only issue is cases don't move backwards, you know, in time, right? Time is still still linear. So there's no way that Roe v. Wade is going to cite to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood will cite to uh, Roe v. Wade, though. So, But but this is a, this is an early example of using this sort of analysis to see what is the underlying structure when, when in this case, the Supreme Court uh, cites, uh, cites itself or cites, you know, pre previous precedent, you know, which, which ones tend to be uh, more prominent, right? Which ones tend to stand the test of time? You can look at that by modeling these as networks. You can also uh, do some navel gazing here. Ask yourself, where do law professors come from? Here, these are modeled as the schools where law professors are coming from and sending to. And as you might imagine there, then the big center of that, Harvard, uh, Yale, uh, you know, the, uh, the sort of uh, traditional, you know, Stanford, uh, Chicago, Berkeley, all in the center of the model, uh, uh, sending sort of out to these other schools and these other schools sending out to other schools as well. This is a, a Daniel Katz did this uh, with, a, with a group of re, uh, scholars there to get an idea again of what exactly the network of this profession is, right? This, the, the legal profession. This is a, re a very recent paper, which I think just got published. Uh, it's a very good paper about uh, gender in the network of Delaware corporate law. This is uh, the uh, the yellow dots represent uh, men and the uh, uh, purple dots represent women. And what they found not they, they didn't just like post this is like figure three of like twenty. There's lots of stuff in the in the paper. It's very good. What they ultimately found is that the networks of female attorneys in the sort of Delaware Chancery Court, the most important court for corporate law in America. Uh, are very different, very distinct from the networks of male attorneys. They tend to have men, uh, uh, men tend to be, uh, have connections to other men. Women tend to have connections to other men as well, right? There aren't that many networks or subgroups of uh, primarily dominated by female lawyers, right? There is, you know, so not only is it sort of, I think it's like 30, 70 in terms of practitioners in this particular area, but the way that the practitioners are distributed still puts men in the sort of center of these networks, right? These are the, these are this, it's a network of people who work together in this particular area, worked on cases together, worked before the same judge before, right? It tends to still have these things. And, and if you believe, and I think there's a lot of evidence for that, that things like career development, things like resources come through these sort of connections that we make in these networks, that can explain a little bit of why there continues to be this sort of gender bias, particularly in this area of law. And uh, again, to get uh, self-referential back to me again, because I've talked about other people way too much now, I got to get, you know, let's get the spotlight back on me. Let's get some shine here. 
This is another project that I worked on, another network project. This is a law firm. This is a large corporate law firm. These are the partners in it. Um, and what they're sort of, you know, model the, the connections as, as have you worked on a matter with another attorney? What is the internal structure of a law firm look like, right? Based on, you know, collected their press releases and said, these are the people who work with one another, color coded them by like, again, this sort of attribute, the, uh, the uh, particular uh, focus, your particular practice area, how does that influence where you are? And you can see, turns out to be specialists that, that huddle right there in the center, right? They're the ones who work with everybody. They generally don't work too much with each other. They generally pick, you know, one or two, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, uh, have very small parts of lots of different deals, lots of different matters, and as a, as a result, occupy this sort of central position in the law firm network. And here's where I'm, I'm going to uh, throw out some, some caution towards using network analysis. I very, believe very strongly network analysis is a great, great complement to other work, I, to other sort of uh, uh, work that you're doing. Because if you just, you know, read network theory and everything like that, you'd say, wow, they must be the most po uh, powerful people in this firm, the specialists, intellectual property, tax, employee benefits, right? Because they occupy these brokerage positions and connect so many parts of this network together. And other organizations that might be true in a law firm, those tend to actually not be the most powerful people. It turned out that the most powerful people, the people uh, who made the most money, the people who were most likely to grab clients and leave tended to be in the periphery of this network. And so you don't, you don't essentially, I mean, you can't learn that by just looking at the network. Instead, you can say, oh, wait a minute. These are all sort of competitors with each other. You know, law firms are colleagues, but they are also competitors, right? And so the people at the, at the edges of the network are the ones who have managed to keep their clients close to the vest, along with them and a couple other trusted colleagues. And that way, if they can, if they need to, they can break away. They can use that sort of leverage within the firm to gain power. So it turns out that the people who are uh, more likely to be in charge, to be on executive committees, things like that, tended to come from the periphery of this network rather than the sort of specialists that were in the center of it. But you can get an idea of, oh, I see why this sort of, why, why the law firm might exist is because everybody needs those specialists. That actually can be the sort of the ties that bind a firm together. You can also um, examine how networks change over time. The network was much more, uh, much more uh, dense. People just basically worked with the people they knew over and over again before the financial crisis. After the financial crisis, when uh, you know, clients went away, uh, there was a drying up of work, all of a sudden, people are way more willing to go outside of their comfort zone, are way more willing to find people across the network that they hadn't worked with before in order to kind of keep working, right? So you can see the way that sort of incentives change, change network structure as well. And there are ways to model this to get, you know, to do the same sort of uh, uh, modeling that I talked about with the judicial network for what drives these changes, right? And, you know, in, the, in this particular case, you know, if people went and sought out um, uh, uh, others that who were in more disparate categories than them, people that were, weren't like them in terms of their educational background or gender or anything like that. They were way more willing to essentially once, you know, they, they were under stress to reach out beyond their initial network to go through these sort of broker ties and find, you know, oh, you've worked with so-and-so, I want to work with you now. We've never met, but like, you know, let, 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 let's do something here because this is a network under stress and they're more willing to do that. So, those are some examples, again, these two tracks, this idea of the uh, uh, objects in the network being legal documents or statutes or sort of whatever it is that has these sort of levels of reference to each other, right? That's the social, the uh, network structure of the law. And then on the flip side, this idea of a social structure of a profession uh, and how these sort of ties between lawyers, which can be work ties in this case, uh, social ties, community ties, things like that, how those influence the way that are, uh, that the legal profession is structured, right? So that's uh, one half of, or no, that's 25 minutes exactly, nailed it. And um, that's, uh, that's what I got, I'll throw it open for uh, uh, questions, comments, uh, criticisms, uh, or uh, uh, a tribute, tribute's good too. Cash is always uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Fluga, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I don't know if there are probably some questions on the chat. And then Simon, are you okay, Daniel? Yes, Daniel, uh, I see your hands up. And uh, for all the other participants, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand or type your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, Daniel, please. 
Yeah. So I can uh, kick this off. Uh, first of all, thank you. I think this was uh, tremendously interesting. So it was perfect for people like me who have never heard about it before mm. um, to get a sense of it. And I think what is um, great about the uh, about the analysis it, it, that is um, it immediately makes sense. So I can listen to you and already think of three hundred projects that would be worth pursuing, or you know, um, with this kind of analysis. Um, what I was thinking of, so for example, in the last months, what I have done is, is basically studying how a specific legal concept or legal idea traveled through decades of Supreme Court jurisprudence mm -hmm. and how it changed. And on the one hand, it now seems like I could have uh, made it so much easier. I, I wouldn't have to, you know, read all the all the all the jurisprudence. I could just uh, look at the citations and do a nice graph, and it looks um, convincing. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if it would really show me all the connections and how the idea traveled, because I mean, there are false citations. So they're like your false friend citations who don't really adapt to the idea, who just quote another article. There are mm -hmm. sometimes cases that idea travel who are not really obviously linked to each other. And I mean, this is not, not only true for, for president citation, of course, but also for any other kind of relations, right? So they are like, I could reach out to some people uh, without really connecting with them and, um, so the quantity of the of the relation doesn't always have to connect to the quality of the kind of citation. One hundred percent. So my, so my I, question would be really how you see like the the relation of you know your kind of work or this quantitative kind of work to qualitative kind of work. Is it a preliminary step? Is it a substitute? Um, yeah. It is one. I mean, I'm just yeah. Uh, that's excellent, and I really that's a very cool project in which to apply network analysis. But it, you didn't waste any time reading stuff. That adds to it. That is the most important part here is bringing your level of knowledge, your level of like expertise in this particular subject to this. It's it's I like I said, it is not like I I very much caution against running this thing and being like, well done. The um uh, for example, the the gender disparity in the Delaware courts uh, uh, project that involves a, that interviewing and talking to and and you know really deep um, sort of mixed methods into what is driving the sort of gender bias that they can observe in the data that they can say like this is I do it you know they talk to uh, uh, even prominent uh, uh, female practitioners in that space who say like yeah I didn't have this sort of deep bench of contacts when I was when I was uh, coming up. Uh, that I could have used. And you can see it in the network. You can find individuals in that network and show, yeah, this is exactly what's still happening here today. So that's number one. Number two is um, the, uh, um, I, uh, I didn't, didn't get into this because this is, you know, I'm trying to keep it, you know, right, you know, beginner level or intermediate level or whatever. Um, you can have a way to sort of weight ties to say like, this one is more important. Like this is just a brief citation versus this is a heavier one. Um, you can have negative ties, ties that have negative valence, where it says this is people are citing this as a as a as a uh, you know we're saying it's wrong or we're saying it's a cautionary tale or I disagree with this. Often those are still predictive of things because you know getting negative attention is still attention. You know what I mean? So like there is you can so you can do things like that that will bring into the network your knowledge of what these the sort of ties mean. A lot of it is going to be. Um, you know, the art of it rather than the science, sorry, you know, I know this isn't law as art, this is a law of science, but is, is justifying why a tie is a tie? Why is it meaningful? Like, is it, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, I went to a law school of 500 other people, I'm not going to lie, I don't think alumni ties are like that important for me, but having, you know, uh, uh, being on a case for six months with somebody else, that, that sort of working tie is way more meaningful than an alumni tie. And you can, you can use sort of like your knowledge of these spaces and of these you know, of these, you know, in your case, this, this doctrine to inform the, how you build the network and the choices that you make in building that network. So yeah, it's, it's definitely not set and forget it. You, and yeah, bring, bring your knowledge, bring your like genius to the network and it'll be better for it. And you, and, and then your results will make more sense. You can say, this is what's happening. And I know why. So. I think we have coffee. Do you have more questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. So, uh, it seems like for citation, actually, the personal preference affect the network and their connections. But right now, you have a different groups, like so many information, like showcase. So, like judge group networking and law firm. Then, what is your value to uh, put the um, evaluating citation of like 
judges level of citation and law firms should be different well like you first uh, analyze all their networking and then see the elements of the background so what mm -hmm. is the process of your analyzing uh, if you're, yeah, so so putting together a network like the law firm network yeah yeah it's it's the process for so first of all it was excellent question First of all, it was, yeah, identifying each lawyer in that network, right? So going through each of their bios, finding every person, everything that I could find about them, whether they uh, were part of the firm's power structure that's on the website. So basically getting all the in, in, in individual information first, right? You create, it. technically you create like a matrix that that uh, it's like, yeah. Anyway, it's, long story short, you make a big sp spreadsheet with all of their, all of the actor information. And then, right, you put in essentially two by two, like a, 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 a sorry, like, just a row and column sort of matrix where you indicate whether or not those actors have ties to each other, right? So it's a zero or one, whether or not they've got a tie. And then when you run the model, essentially analyzes, okay, what's the probability of this tie existing given everything we know, right, about the actors there, right? What is really pushing this? What is really generating these particular ties? Because like, you don't ever want to say like, oh, every these are 100% generated by this particular attribute or this particular connection or this particular network structure. A lot of the things just happen randomly, right? You just happen to be the judge who has an opinion on this particular point. You just happen to work with this particular person and things like that. The question is, if it, we're not dealing with a sort of just a random sort of assortment of ties, what's the sort of organizing principle for those ties, right? How do you take all the stuff you already know about the actors in here and say, yeah, these ones, this is happening way more than you would expect by chance that, for example, you know, in the, in the Delaware context that, that their work, it's way more than a uh, chance that men are, are, are forming connections with men, given the number of women in the, in the, in the network, given the number of ties that are, are created, like how many cases, how many matters, how many judges, right? We can say like, it's, it's, just, it's just not um, uh, something that you can expect by chance this particular, these, to see these particular structures. So yeah, you just you start by getting as much information on the, on the people in the network as possible or the actors or the documents or whatever it is, and then go from there, which is, can be difficult because you don't always know everything, right? There's always the sort of worry that you've got um, some sort of uh, um, unknown uh, uh, or unquantifiable like factor there. So you just kind of have to, you know, again, you know, acknowledge that as a limitation of the of the of the of the work. But at the same time, if you see sort of the factors, these 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 magnitude of factors that you can see in some of these networks, you can say that's very it's very unlikely that there could be some other unmeasured uh, variable that is producing this sort of effect. And then there's Simon. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think as uh, as Daniel uh, mentioned, um, this is something that um, that really excites me on on um conducting better legal analysis when it comes to court cases. Um so yeah I'm also interested in that part which um can you kind of explain a little bit more on um the network uh, this analysis of law but then how does that and specifically on court court citations mm -hmm. but how would this interact with analogical reasoning where lawyers can have different understanding of the same case? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe extending to that, um, now we have a Supreme Court mostly uh, with conservative judges, and um, the way they they understand a case might be different from a liberal court. But so then, how would your um, or how would this theory itself kind of facilitate our understanding of this phenomenon on um, court citations, interpretation of the same cases or even different cases um, on 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 that aspect? Yeah. I think that uh, yeah, the the evolution of like the the meaning of a particular uh, either case or statute or anything like that, absolutely. There's a there's a good sort of network application for that, and that's the uh, sort of I don't know exactly what the phrase is. I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's like you can tell a lot about somebody by their friends. So a citation network basically says, okay, if you had this particular case and for 10, 15 years it was cited, and you can see this sort of like network of cases that cite it. And they all reach a certain outcome, or it looks like they're all citing it for a certain part, you know, like it supports this particular thing, right? You can use, again, your doctrinal analysis of these cases to explain what's going on. But then you see, right, that case being cited by a completely different area of law, right? It's just, you've turned it 180, right? I don't know. Um, 
you know, um, um, uh, uh, the Roberts court seems to believe that like Brown versus board mandates race blindness or something like that. And you're like, that doesn't, there was, you know, 30 years of case law that didn't, that it had nothing to do with that. And now all of a sudden we've got like uh, parents and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, what is it? Parents involved, the Seattle case, whatever it is, and its progeny, you can see it if it's being cited by those, and those are citing it, and they're citing the the, the cases that cite it, right? You've got this sort of thing. That's the nice part about networks. It's these ties of ties of ties. You can see it evolve in a different way, right? You can so it's 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 a matter of like using that sort of longitudinal analysis. You can do there's way complicated stuff about doing it like as a as one data set, but it's it's an easy way to do it is just snapshots. What was the network citation network of this particular case or this doctrine? back in the day, what is it now, right? How does that change? Who is this being cited by and for what, right? So you can see that evol evolution in the network in a way that, you know, uh, should match up with your understanding of how it's it's changed in the, in the doctrine. Uh, thank you very much. Um... I do have a question as well if there is if there are any questions on the chat or anyone else has any other common questions, concerns. No. Okay. So um thank you again for um agreeing to talk to talk to us today. Uh, I find this network analysis extremely fascinating. Um and uh, so since the network analysis has its origins on sociometrics and also on Ramadan theory, uh, I think that the accent that you took today was uh, a lot focused on what are these strong connections that we also need to look at the weak ties, right, to everything that is not strongly connected, but how much this information is going to be relevant if it's only on the peripheries. We do um, talk a little, more, a little bit more uh, in deep on this uh, part of the network analysis. So um, I, I, it's, it's a little hard to hear you. Uh, I think just the, the echo in, oh. in the room. And the idea is like the, uh, are you talking, uh, you said something about like the theory of network analysis and how that influences things. Was that what I heard? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, basically it's uh, more about you. Uh, today show us a lot of uh, how this information travels and how uh, we can do different types of analysis for our own research that is much more focused on how these strong ties work and mm -hmm. how is a strong connection. Um, it's not only limited to that network analysis, uh, but obviously because of uh, time constraints and also the um, the relevance also of this uh, type of uh, talks that cannot be that much deeper. Uh, but could you briefly elaborate a little bit on how can we also do network analysis only on the weak ties? Oh, on the weak, yeah, definitely. Okay, so the the uh, you're right that the, a lot of these are, are are what are called strong ties, right? The idea of um, uh, you know, I, these are strong friendships, things like that. Uh, the weak ties were formalized as this idea that, you know, um, it's, it's not, how do I put this? It goes along with what I, what I mentioned before about clusters, how the clusters show that, you know, these are, these are people that, you know, work together, know each other, or they're friends, whatever it is. The, um, the, the strength of weak ties is that if you have a bunch of strong ties, everybody knows everything in that, that little subgroup, right? You don't have new information really entering that those things because everybody's just talking to one another. You all know exactly what you all know. Weak ties have been theorized as this way for information to get into right new groups. So the idea was you don't get, the, the canonical study was about how to get a job, right? And people didn't get their jobs through their friends. They got jobs through friends of friends. That's to say people they didn't have strong ties with, but who had this sort of like, other sort of network of people, people outside their sort of core network, this sort of dense network, they were able to get that. So, and you know, this was, this is true. Like I got a job once through some guy that I barely knew, um, but I was, it was a very good friend of a friend of mine, right? And that is like this sort of way that resources can, can get in. So again, this is, this is where knowing something about how the, uh, uh, what the network means and what this sort of uh, conditions it's operating in really matter. Is it like, is it important to have these strong ties to have what's called closure, right? This sort of social cohesion around this group, or is it more useful to have these sort of weak ties in your network that you can essentially, you know, occasionally call on to get like resources or things that are outside uh, what you what you currently have? And so you look at something like a law firm. Yeah, you want if you're 
putting together something, if you're working on a deal or a case or something like that, you want strong ties. You want to be able to rely on people for their experience and their knowledge and all that sort of stuff. But you're also going to want weak ties because you're going to want to say, hey, do you, you know, I've got, I can do X, Y, and Z. Does any of your clients, right? Do any of your clients need that? And you can have them essentially refer to the, the client to you inside the firm. So you want this sort of, uh, you want a sort of combination, depending on the organization, depending on what you need, you want this combination of strong ties to be able to get, you know, uh, to be able to use, uh, get the sort of resources of those around you. But also you want these weak ties to get opportunities, right? So it's it's a come it's it's this sort of balancing act between getting yeah being access to resources and access to opportunities because those don't come through or don't always come through the same sort of tie. And this you know again goes back to the idea that you can measure these ties. You can give them sort of different different attributes, right? Um, there's a French sociologist uh, named Emmanuel Lazega who has made uh, uh, organizational networks, and he just overlays them. He says there are friendship ties in these organizations. There are uh, business ties in these organizations, right? There are, uh, you know, um, advice ties in these organizations. Those aren't the same thing, but we can put them all in this, give them different sort of attributes, ma make it clear what kind of tie they are, and then see which ones really matter for different different things that people in the organization needs. So yeah, exactly. The idea that you can you can have uh, uh, these different kinds of ties that offer different things. That's true, basically. Yeah, in any of these networks um, that, that that you look at, and those are that's another you know you know another sort of as, uh, attribute to to, uh, to network analysis. Did that come close to answering the question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, Simon, do you have anything to add? So you yeah, so um uh so anyone uh joining online, if you have uh any questions, uh please um you can either raise your hand, um open your camera, or just type it in the chat box and I can uh read them for you. Vanessa, I don't think there are uh, people um, on. I mean, people online. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank I've, yeah. Yeah. So, um, thank you and join me for giving a round of applause to our speaker today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, before uh, we let everyone go, can we uh, all take a picture together? Open up your camera. Now take a quick screenshot. And uh, Professor uh, Klugo, if you want to leave this uh, screen? I'm open to that. <laughs> I thought people could send you. <laughs> I'll go ahead. And stop the share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, please open up um, your camera and uh, Professor Kluge can stop. Okay. I think. Let me see how I can make sure everyone's name is out there. For some reason. Um, I can only see uh, Professor Kluger's face in front of. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> okay, gallery. Okay, now now it's good. All right. Um. So, um. One, two, three. And Vanessa, you can uh smile to the uh camera uh from the uh from the room. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. All right. Well. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for uh, for joining us. And we see Professor Klugel shared uh, his email, alan.klugo at uky.edu. Yeah, send 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 me anything, any questions. If you you know, just yeah, any, I'm always happy to always happy to help. Link you up with uh, link you up with better scholars than me that I can always help you with. You know, and and uh, you know, people can actually be useful. No, no, I'm just kidding. Like, yeah, please, please be in touch. This is a very again, thank you to the organizers. A very very cool thing for uh, for everybody. And uh, I hope that you know, you again got a really really killer lineup of uh, of people here coming up. So this is if think think this is good, it's going to get way better. Well, thank you for kicking it off <laughs> for us. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Uh, See you guys. Well, the recordings of this session, and uh, I see you all next week. Okay.